the webinars, people come just a few minutes late. Um, it's a real pleasure to welcome you all and everybody who's still coming to the Footprint webinar <clears throat> 2024. And what is the Footprint? Essentially, it's our original beans uh, sustainability report for the previous year. And as we go through that report, which is, of course, very specific to Origin of Beans, we're trying to speak uh, about bigger issues that are part of our industry and part of our challenge in the world around sustainability, around social equity, around health, <clears throat> around things that are really important for chocolate, but may also be important for other industries, for other ways to do social enterprise, and for us as consumers just as well. I would invite you to uh, fasten your seatbelts because we have only one hour and it's going to be very intense in terms of uh, data input, uh, discussion points. And along the way, I invite you to essentially put your questions, comments into our shared uh, comment space um, on the right side panel of your screen. So we can pick that up along the way um, and we, we um, can essentially um, try to answer all the questions that may come up. All right, a uh, quick introduction of who we are, the two of us, Jan and myself, who are going to uh, run you through this webinar. Um, I'm Philip Kaufmann. I'm the founder of Original Beans. And if I'm going to share two things about myself that are relevant in this uh, context, then perhaps one that I'm really an entrepreneur by heart and by uh, drive. I believe that um, business can be very different than much of the business we see around us. Um, and I really believe in what you would call social enterprise or impact enterprise, a way to doing business that puts the effects and impact and returns for society and other stakeholders just in the same model as the returns for private owners. And perhaps the other thing that I'd like to tell you about myself, if you look at this photo, because one of the things that, that sort of go, goes through me in a way, flows through me, is, uh, is a legacy of uh, seven generations that are involved, of my family that have been involved in nature conservation. And sometimes it's funny to think that I could sit with my you know, ancestors seven generations back in the late 18th century around the table, and we could discuss the topics that I'm still busy with now, 200 plus years later, which is, you know, how to manage forests, how to be sustainable, how to think about the future generations in such a way that they have the same benefits of the earth that, that we enjoy. And that was a theme back then, and that's a theme still now. So that's me in a nutshell in terms of my motivation. And then I'm really proud to have Jan in our conversation. Jan, you wanna introduce yourself? Yes, um, good evening. Hello everybody. So my name is Jan Schubert. I'm originally from Germany, but I'm joining from Ecuador where I live for many years already. Um, I am original beans conservation cacao leader. That means I'm in charge of our project development impact work and also the cacao quality. Um, so to assure that we get the beans not only in the best quality, but also 100% traceable and with the best impact possible to our warehouse to Amsterdam. My background is in food technology. So I studied food technology and uh, food analytics. And my heart really is on the quality side of cacao. And thanks to Philip, I learned uh, about the impact that this cacao can have. So uh, it's already 14 years ago that I have been the first time in origin. And since then, more and more getting away from not only looking to the quality of cacao, but really of the uh, impact that it can have on the forest, on the people. And yeah, that's uh, what drives me. And therefore, I'm more or less half of my working time out there in our projects with our farmers, with our partners. Thanks, Jan. So um, I think just to kick off, um, because we live in a world where headlines can sometimes be somber when you think about the future of 
uh, nature, ecology, probably also our society at large, if you if you follow the climate uh, discourse. And, and we are not of that mold. We, we of course, see the data and uh, everybody who ignores the data is, uh, is ignorant and stupid. But, um, but we think that there is a huge opportunity as well to mobilize our society, our economy around what we call reg regeneration. And at Origin Means, we just want to be an example of how that looks and what that means. And if you see that graph, then we've kept the left side of the graph, which is the decline of nature in the last two gener generations and, and the change of the atmosphere of the Earth in the last two generations. We have kept it relatively mind and really we want to emphasize the, um, you know, the recovery that we that is ahead and and the the will to recovery and this webinar is essentially going to run through aspects of recovery that hopefully at the end of of that session will will make you pretty optimistic about what's what's possible um and one of the things that are amazing is uh, is chocolate and uh, this graph is a bit complicated but I'll, I'll I'll explain it to you. So bear with me for a second. It says chocolate is a nature savior or a nature killer. Um, and if you go to the fourth line of the graph, you can see chocolate there. So it's beef, lamb, farm prawns, and then chocolate, farm fish, chicken, and so forth. These are the climate impacts or nature impacts of those particular foods. And Left side are sort of the low impacts or positive impacts, even if you if you go further left, in green of that particular food. And then to the right side, you get into the red zone of high impact, high negative impact. So destruction of forests, uh, um, of ecosystems, of uh, um, uh, local societies, and so forth. And what I find really astounding, we should really mark for those people of us, and most of us are in this seminar and webinar, in chocolate is the the spread of of the product chocolate from green to red so it it is it can be the greenest of all the products in this list by far and it can be one of the worst on the on the on the red side so there is really a, an an extreme uh, distinction going through what we call chocolate um, from what is virtuous and on the um, red side was what is uh, vicious and and so there is a lot of things we can gain by moving from what is red to moving uh, what is green and that's what we call regeneration and we've started that journey more than a decade ago uh, in you know w with the unchanged mission and we have a motto that says essentially speak what's true eat what's pure preserve what's rare and we followed that motto and many of our customers and partners and uh, team as much as we can follow th that uh, mission. And so that's essentially how we've come to build eight supply chains, value chains, places of cacao out there in different ecosystems. You can see the, um, the dots and really each of those origins and beans and uh, cacao uh, places has a story to tell. And I wanted to ask uh, Jan, who lives in Ecuador and, and speaks from there, just to open the window of the latest one year or month uh, and what's happening in Ecuador, which was a year ago, just a totally different country. Yes, so if we look to Ecuador, we are working in the north of the country in Esmeraldas on the border to, to Colombia, which is one of the most important <coughs> coastal rainforests in the world it's called Chocó. And um, there always have been problems for this rainforest, but in the, let's say, last three years, the political situation in Ecuador has changed quite a lot. Philip mentioned the last month. I think the last month only were like so bad that it made it to the news in Europe, but before we had like same issues. So there's a drug war going on in Ecuador. Um, a lot of different gangs that want to gain the access to the harbor of Guayaquil, which is um, the harbor where also our cacao leaves the country. And obviously, 
or not obviously, but maybe for you for, as an information, Ecuador does not grow any coca leaves. So all the coca and cocaine that is smuggled through Ecuador comes from Peru, comes from Colombia. And the one that comes from Colombia comes through Esmeraldas, just the area where we where we work still with our farmers, but it has been, yeah, a complicated year uh, with a lot of problems to be solved. You can imagine if you, you're getting your cacao from an area which is now controlled in big parts by guerrilla organizations, but we still managed it and we still managed to give the farmers there that are in big parts, uh, part of an indigenous community called Chachis, the hope of um, the most sustainable income you can have in this area, which is cacao grown in very diverse cacao forests that we will present afterwards. Yeah, thanks, Jan. Um, so it's never, get, it's never getting boring <laughs> in, in cacao land. Um, um, by the way, the Esmeraldas are the two blue uh, dots, or blue and uh, the, the yellow one um, that you can see on the left uh, top. All right, so that was a quick window in one of um, the places and how much <clears throat> the world is changing there. And as we look to the other side of our uh, value chain and business, um, we have been grown into Europe's leading craft chocolate. and. Um, the stories are just as fascinating, probably not as dramatic as what uh, Jan just reported from Ecuador. Uh, when we look uh, to our customers, um, chefs, um, food retailers, ice makers, bakers, you know, wonderful food makers all over Europe and also in some instances even beyond that. So that's our business. And ta-da! We can report as of yesterday that that business is once again the world's number one sustainable chocolate 2024 uh, scored by the uh, chocolate scorecard which is an amazing effort to essentially compare uh, chocolate companies by now also including supermarkets retailers in a way that um, that makes them sort of <laughs> that puts pressure uh, to on all of them to do better and and to score the winners and to score the losers and and promote that as as good as possible um so we're very proud that our work that we're here presenting has actually um been awarded or scored in that way and we have the good egg, egg award 2024. Jan, something else that's in the headlines right now and we wanted to address this because probably a lot of you have already read about it and uh, probably those of you who are in the chocolate business are worrying about it yes so <clears throat> we have another day of the highest world market prices ever seen today a record of eight thousand six hundred uh dollars per ton and you might <clears throat> have seen that in the news what i think is really uh, funny is that last year it started maybe in June, July, the prices increased and by September, October, it was big, at least in German news, that prices have uh, been at 4000 because even $4,000 per ton has been something that has been never seen before in the last decade. So you can see here on this graphic the prices over the last eight years so from 2016 to now and you can see there always was a certain fluctuation of the world market prices between 2000 and on top three thousand dollars per ton and as original beans our strategy always was not only to pay a much higher price but to pay a stable price that the farmers really can rely on and it, this was always a little bit uh, below five thousand dollars per ton but as said last year these prices started increasing today we are at eight thousand six hundred world market which also means that if you still want to have access to quality and organic certified beans you need to pay thousand more so uh, our prices are also increasing quite dramatically and um, before we come to the point why, it's like what I think is very important to see what gets, what is the benefit for the farmer. And that's very different depending on where you live. For example, here in Ecuador, um, the street prices are as crazy high as the world market price. So you get about 8,000, well, let's say $7,500 per ton just on the street for everything that looks like cacao right now. 
so the street prices have also increased by uh, almost tripled, I would say. So huge benefit for all the cacao farmers, but unfortunately now there's also no uh, sense for them or no, um, Incentive. why should they do quality you know it's like they get paid anyhow very well but if you look to west africa to ghana and the ivory coast where more than 50 percent of the cacao comes from these days then there is a so-called cacao board which is a governmental institution that regulates the cacao price and at the moment they set the price to $1.66. So even if you pay more than $8,000 on the world market for cacao, the farmers receive really a very, very bad portion of this price. And that uh, brings us to the to the reason of this price increase. Maybe you have followed the, the media and you have seen, okay, it's because there was a bad harvest season in West Africa. As I said, they produce more than 50% of the world production. So if something happens there, it affects the whole world. But uh, we think it's the chronic cacao problems. They just add up. It's not one problem. And part of this problem is definitely this very low cacao price in the Ivory Coast and in Ghana low farm gate prices at the same time rising costs you have seen in the last you seen in the last last eight years there was uh, not any increase in cacao prices but the living the cost of living has increased a lot you have yo low yields you have still the same problems that discussed since decades of child labor human trafficking forced labor and then this all adds up to the environmental problems because if you have not enough income, then you will try to get your cacao to produce with it, whatever it takes. So a high usage of agrochemicals, you might, might uh, cut down the last forest you still had. So all these adds up to the crisis we have seen. And it's if you look at the map of Ivory Coast, the biggest cacao producer of the world, it's really, really sad to see that you have here the map of 1990 with all the forest coverage and then of 2015, where, where you can see that from this forest, there is not a lot left. It has been all converted to cacao fields, but very unsustainable ones that now with uh, the challenges of climate change and so on they just don't produce and so it will be definitely a problem for for the future maybe not as high as we see the cacao price now but the cacao price in our opinion will stay higher than what we had seen the last years and the answers to that is just what the chocolate scorecard has been asking so they have been asking about traceability and transparency, living income, child labor, deforestation, climate, agroforestry and pesticides. And you can see that in all these six categories, original beans scores green. And we are the proudly the only company that scores green in all these six categories. And we think that's the only way if we want to have chocolate in the future, then we need really urgently to change the things to be able to produce cacao in the future. Yes, and of course, to change these things, uh, companies have, have to <clears throat> hold themselves accountable to, uh, to, to what we then now term regeneration, but certainly the, the positive and more general impacts to society. And that's what the chocolate footprint is for original beans. It is essentially, as I said, our sustainability report. And um, it's a pretty short document for a sustainability report. Um, why that? Well, we, for one, we, we wanted to keep it simple. So we wanted to keep sort of the numbers relatively simple. And then, of course, um, it's also hard to get by data um, that are reliable and consistent and you know um, that you you can actually uh, have something across eight uh, origins and regions. So what you can see here is essentially five columns that address the rarity of cacao. So the the genetic and and uh, um, produce basis, the fairness question, the question of nature and conservation, the question of climate, and the question of health. And much of this overlaps with what you just saw in the last slide, which is. Uh, the scorecard uh, score. So that's 
come to the same conclusion totally independently and uh, it uh, affirms us that these kpis are regular you know similar kpis are really what what, uh, what is relevant for for us as a business but also for the public at large and here's how the uh, footprint then looks for our customer and it's really very cool uh, in this case, a wonderful chocolate company from Ireland called Bean and Goose, um, who use our curvatures. And <clears throat> we, based on our database, we can essentially give them the data of their, their footprint, their impact uh, for 2023. And you can see the bean counter, which uh, is counted uh, 7.7 uh, 7 .7, uh, tons of chocolate used in 2023 by them and it, it boils down to nearly 150,000 cacao fruits and for me that is actually something that speaks so we, here's one customer and they use 150,000 cacao fruits and if you think of you know a cacao fruit being harvested being chopped up being you know uh, uh, fermented and so forth and so forth it's it's a lot this is a lot so um you have other uh, numbers here in uh uh, green down uh, on the right, the climate impact, which is essentially the net sequestration of CO2 um, through trees and uh, tons of CO2. You can you can see the numbers here, and on the left side, which we are going to get into uh, just in a minute, um, the, the clearness claim and the 100% living income guarantee, which we uh, give. So this is the footprint for our customers. And this is how the footprint actually gets measured. Okay. Jan didn't want to have this. He was he was saying he wanted a new a new picture because of course you can see this is a decade old. But I think it's quite he can he can wear this proudly, you know, more than a dec more than a decade in in the in the rainforest uh, measuring trees. So what you can see here is <clears throat> part of the data collection. So most of our partners already, as you can see, even ten years ago. <laughs> I uh, use uh, technology to get all this data. So it's collected on phones, on tablets. Um, our The most important tool that we have to make these data collections as straightforward as we can is organic certification, right? because organic certification gives you a traceability down to farm gate level. And there is quite a lot of questions that the cooperatives or associations we work with already need to fill out for these external audits. And what we do as original beans, we just add our questions to these questionnaires that then are transferred by, by tablet or by phone to their internal um, applications and web systems. And on the other hand, obviously, it's why we can get all this data thanks to our amazing teams on the ground, the team of our partners, in this case, the NGO EDAT, which is working in Congo, and they are a NGO financed 100% by Original Beans and doing all the supportive work for the farmers, training courses, capacity buildings, uh, establishing of gardens to grow vegetables, all our nurseries and so forth and so forth. And obviously they also work on the reporting of all the work. And thanks to this reporting, we have the data that we present in our footprint. Yeah. And if I see this photo, then I always uh, want to remind uh, us all, uh, ourselves included, myself included, that uh, where these guys are working is civil war. Um, you know, the reports that Eric, who is the second from the left and the leader of the team, sends to us regularly, you know, they report about abductions and, um, you know, the burning of entire villages, the, the, the eviction of thousands of farmers and people who have to leave their villages because marauding uh, bandits are, you know, burning and shooting uh, with some ideology in mind. So this is really a very, very, very tough spot um, to work in with uh, security issues, health issues. And and those guys are just so committed to to the their communities and the regeneration of their society that it's, it's a constant inspiration for us to do better. And here we go now into the footprint. And the first category, if you remember, was the rare and pure, which is uh, Jan's absolute passion. We go directly into 
what well perhaps i can say this is to me this is a great photo for you know for 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 the understanding of what cacao is as an analogy to to a to a european fruit tree this is a uh, more than 100 year old uh, chunchu tree in uh, from peru and i think there's hardly a photo of a cacao tree that looks so analogous to uh, european fruit trees that we are used to that i think it it makes a good point and it's a very very special tree and of course this leads us into the uh, kpi that we report on eight rare cacao, cacao varieties regrown. And yes, as Philip says, that's my passion. And I think it's some, uh, something that is not reflected yet in something like the scorecard or any external questions and reporting. And it's just so important because if we talk about rare, rare cacao varieties, we have to talk about the usage because if nobody eats a food, then it will just disappear and you will lose all the genetic resources. And this is happening in cacao, even we are still studying which cacao varieties do exist, which are out there. We are losing a lot of biodiversity already, biodiversity that could help us to face the climate changes that could be better adapted to dryness, to flooding. And what we see is that modern hybrid cacaos are on the rise. And, this, and I think it's even worse than in Europe, all of you know this notice that in a normal supermarket, at least in Germany, nowadays you only have three varieties of apples or four sometimes. And in cacao, it's the same. You have like some modern varieties here on the left. You can see CC151 created more than 40 years ago in Ecuador, which is nowadays in some Latin American countries already 90% of the harvest volume and of the hectares grown with it. And as original beans, we want to do it different. As the name says, original beans, we focus on old genetics. And I wanted to include here a little bit of scientific background because in the chocolate industry, on packaging, you often can read about genetic groups of Criollo, of Juncho, but mainly sometimes look at the form of a fruit and says, oh, it looks similar to what I have seen in a book to Criollo. Let's call it Criollo. There's really not a lot of scientific background. In our case, that's different. We are working since seven years already with Biodiversity International on genetic screening in a lot of our projects. And what you can see here are the results of trees that we use to replant and to give to new farmers from Colombia, from the Aduaco, their Bunzi cacao, genetically 100% Criollo, not 90%, not 99, 100%. Uh, the genetic results of our Juncho cacao, also an own variety, very, very old, 100% Juncho, and the same for Piura Blanco, it's also an own genetic group and 100% pure. And if you now think to the analogy that is often made to cacao with wine, then you would say, yeah, sure, that's normal in wine growing. Yes, might be in wine, but in cacao, absolutely not. So if you randomly sample trees on farms, then you would rather get this kind of graphics from one tree. It's not the mix of a farm, it's the genetic mix of just one tree. So on the left, if I'm not wrong, that's from, from Bolivia. So you can see this tree is a mix of four old uh, groups, Amenolado, Ticuña, Scavina, and Criollo. Uh, might be good cacao, it's just that it's not one pure genetic. And the next two, they are from Ecuador, just random sampling here in Ecuador. And you can see that all of them already include quite a lot of modern hybrids. Both of them have traces of CCN51 in it. The one has traces of ICS95, which is a clone from the Trinidad and Tobago. The other has a TSH clone in it, which comes from Costa Rica, if I'm not wrong. So you can see there's all this mix and unfortunately mix already with modern hybrids that we just don't want to, to have in our cacaos. And it's hard work together with our partners to yeah to to assure that what we grow is not getting mixed with this modern hybrids cacaos not yeah, only for yeah. taste yeah yeah, yeah yeah go 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 yeah i had a not only for taste but also 
because as said initially in in this genetic we have all the resources to adapt to climate change we have or often cacaos that are much better adapted to agroforestry systems and so it's really one of the most important parts of original beans to preserve these these old genetics yeah okay you thank you you answered the question that i had which was you know what's in it for the farmer because of course you know as a company that is our mission and and that's our work but the question would have been okay what's in it for the farmer if you keep that um genetic uh, purity and i think what i heard you say certainly was well there's there's a there's a flavor advantage which probably carries a premium um but there's also this uh ecological advantage a certain robustness and probably there's also a cultural advantage which is the identity at least in some places I mean, I rem remember our discussions with the Aruaco, which were really about the heritage of an, an, an old cacao and, and their cultural identity, and those two were connected for them. So and to be honest, Philip, it's also about productivity. Um, mm -hmm. So if you have, there's always this total misunderstanding that you need hybrids to produce a lot. And if we see the the real productivity of a CCN51 clone in the hands of a more or less badly educated smallholder farmer. It's just super bad. Obviously, on a highly technologized farm, it can be super good, no doubt about that. But we can find native cacaos that are much better adapted not only to microclimates, but also to the reality of smallholder farmers that need less pruning, that need hardly any fertilizers and things like that. So if you then look on the real productivity of the farm, these native cacao varieties can be even more productive than, than modern hybrids. Right. Yes. Thank you. So next one, perhaps for me, because of course, <clears throat> what you just uh, represented was the genetic uh, purity and selection. <clears throat> and and or on the other side the mix and of course once you have you know ge the genetics sorted out then that, that goes through the value chain as well so um you know our uh kpi here uh, in the footprint is 100 percent single variety beans and you need to keep that then throughout the entire chain up until production and and into the chocolate and here's an image just to show how this would go if you go the normal industry mixed route where you already on the farm have a genetic mix and then on the street <laughs> on the asphalt in the sun you you mix up about yeah philip and i think it's so important to show these pictures because if somebody is into specialty chocolate we are getting flooded all the day with uh, farmers harvesting fully ripe fruits and then fermenting them in wooden boxes and drying them two weeks carefully by hand and yes these projects exist but the reality here on the street as a photo from ecuador just taken on, on the road is is totally the opposite you just get everything off the tree if it's ripe or not if it's moldy or not you don't care you put it on the asphalt and there it dries and then you put it in an open container ship it to the to amsterdam and put it on a five thousand tons pile in a warehouse just if if, if it would be construction material right yeah, well, it is construction material for Kit Kat uh, 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 clunks, <laughs> chunks. All right. Um, the the difference, the distinction is 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 you know back to that slide where you had the red and the green, you know, very much in the beginning. So this is the green side, and and I mean it starts with hand selection uh, on farm. This is a photo from Tanzania, and and that's the work, you know, that's the work to get the the you know the right sizes the right qualities by hand uh, with a good eye in a in a very quick selection um to an even better grading and then again all the way through the chain into a warehouse where all the uh, bags you know are of of one uh, varietal they are you know trays they are on their pallets they are in a special cooled warehouse so there is no insect uh, contamination or mold contamination and and on it goes so um, that is really uh, you know a, a totally different uh, supply chain than the other one which is sort of what, what i showed in the beginning as the red as the red thread organic agriculture is part of it 
Yeah, it's part of it because we are talking always about selection and quality, but we really have to recognize that uh, organic is just so important also for the traceability of all that we are doing. So it's only certification that gives you real um, traceability back to farm gate level. Fair trade cannot guarantee that and others also not. And please always be aware organic certification it's not a private company company like most of the other labels it's an eu law and it's controlled by official institutions you know so i think that's one of the most important points that all our beans are not only from highest quality but organic certified and then what you can see in this picture and also on the next is and for original beans, it's it's not enough that we have like organic by default, because that is the reality. A lot of smallholder farmers just don't have the money to get their hands on, fer on fertilizers or pesticides. And then it's also organic, but really make them or support them on their way to get professional organic farmers that they can brew, you <laughs> call it brew, their own fertilizers, that they can process their own fertilizers and uh, yeah professionalize in their life of smallholder farmers thanks cool okay so this was around traceability uh selection <clears throat> and the next one is uh if you remember the the column from the uh, footprint is about fairness and fairness um is is in the first instance uh, very often a discussion in currently in the industry around living income and for those who are not familiar with the term it's a term that sort of emerged in the last five to six seven years as the standard reference for a minimum income for cacao growers um, and of course since cacao grow growers are not uh, employees this is sort of a an, a micro entrepreneurial minimum income on the farm that gets calculated uh, by index numbers around, you know, the, the cost of living and the cost of schooling and the cost of, you know, running a cacao uh, farm. And then of course the income, it, it, it has uh, national uh, statistics and, and then sub-national statistics. And ultimately in our case, now on an average, it comes down to something that we are among the few to guarantee for uh, our growers across uh, all regions and of course based on the data we have and there there can be a long discussion about what those data are and how you compare that to the you know increasing cost of living and the cost of living index etc but what that um, the slide shows you on the left side you have in gray blue the income from cacao sale on average you have the production costs in dark green and then in red uh, the net income and then the living income reference as an average uh, per country uh, Ecuador is very different than Congo and Bolivia would be very different than uh, Peru so um, that you know if we had time this would be a very fascinating discussion to dig in but um, sure to say that the industry is really discussing this all the time <laughs> but <laughs> very few are doing it because as, as uh, Jan explained in the beginning, the cacao prices have been historically so low and are still in South Af in uh, West Africa for uh, growers that uh, living income is always uh, hypothetical and it's never a real. Um, training is also part of the story. Um, training in various forms for organic agriculture, for uh, food, uh, nutrition, and so forth. And we report 2,944 growers, schools, and 40% of them women. And perhaps, Jan, you want to explain what we see here, because we don't see many women on this photo, are we? <clears throat> yeah, exactly. <laughs> we don't see any women, but that's the uh, reality of traditional cacao, of a lot of traditional cacao growing areas. Uh, cacao is often a family crop so um, everybody is involved but um, often the farmers who sign up as members for association for a project for the cooperative are the men so if you then do the obligation training courses of for example organic certification then you have these kind of images only men sitting there 
And um, if you look at this, then 40% women participation that we have overall in training courses is really a lot because in these training courses, you have normally not even 10%. So what you can see on the, on the next picture is that with all our partners together, we organize special training courses for, for women. So um, most of these photos are from Congo where we have training courses in um, vegetable growing, like what, what you can see in the middle. Huge, huge cabbages. Yeah, huge. yeah the, the idea of these programs were nutrition improvement for the farmer families, yeah. but now they produce so much that they sell tons of it to the local markets. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. Then also women to get them involved more in the nursery work and that they are like the leaders of the nurseries. You can see on the top left uh, that was a mushroom course, if I'm not um, misleading. On the uh, yeah. on the left below, that's from Ecuador. It's about cacao grafting, so how to assure the genetics and thereby also the productivity of the plants. Also, something that we see that women are normally a lot, uh, very very interested. And then the soaring courses on the on the right top. So, as original beans, we really push to have and offer by our partners a lot of training courses especially by women so that we change this traditional 90 10 from men women to 50 50 and yeah that's that's our mission 50 50 uh 50 50 people 50 nature um so uh, we move in the footprint to the next column which is what we call wild nature we call it wild nature because it is really about wild nature out there, the forests, um, the, the you know not the, the agroforestry system as such, but the forests out there behind the fields, and um, in essence, all our um, origins have been selected by the criteria to play a role in what is called biodiversity or global biodiversity conservation. Um, they are all hotspot rainforests, and you can see a map here. I'm not going to go into the details, but this is all science underlying. You know the Choco in Ecuador, the Virunga in uh, 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 Congo. These are all hotspots that biologists say need to be preserved in order to represent the genetic uh, um, inheritance of life on Earth. <clears throat> and we're doing a little bit to do that. Um, and it's brought us into a space where we also have um, trusted partnerships with indigenous people in Ecuador with the Chachi and here the image of the Aroco in uh, northern Colombia, which essentially has inspired us <coughs> and, and pushed us forward to consider whether we could not have an even bigger impact than or an additional impact to the agroforestry system that cacao provides and, and figure out a model by which the forests behind the fields really get protected. Um, at current, we have sometimes uh, conservation agreements uh, we'll get to that in a minute, but really when it comes to 10,000 or 100,000 of hectares of forest, then our cacao business cannot reach it. It can just reach the people. And then uh, essentially we launched a new business called Sacred Forest that takes care of, you know, the big forest behind the fields. And you can learn more about Sacred Forest and Circuit Forest at Earth and follow the story there. In the meantime, we want to go back to regenerative agroforestry because it's a super powerful tool and in the discussion around regenerative agriculture which you may follow and see popping up everywhere from big corporates uh, like Danone and Nestle to uh, small companies and even the restaurant sector agroforestry is often underestimated it's really a different you know a, a different uh, factor of impact than um, you know what you would fee, uh, you find in the, in a in a in a uh, annual uh, crop uh, rotation. So 100% of our um, crop is grown in regenerative agroforestry. And Jan, you want to say something about yeah, this? Yeah, if you go image. back uh, once more, the photo was still ah, from yeah. the Aruaco, and I yeah. think that's uh, that's yeah. so important here because you really have this connection of okay. 
behind the fields, behind the villages, we have uh, sometimes primary, sometimes secondary forests, huge areas that these uh, indigenous communities are conserving, but also uh, closer to the village and often in the buffer zone of nature reserves, of uh, national parks, you have these amazing cacao forests that you can see here on the left from the Arhuacos, which you cannot do with a lot of other crops. So it's a huge advantage of cacao and it, it goes back to the um, image that Philip or the, the, yeah, the, the green dot, that the Philip, green dot. <laughs> um, showed at the beginning, the green dot, because you can't grow other things like you can grow cacao and also coffee just in a mix with a lot of native tree species, with banana, with uh, mango, with citrus fruits. What you can see here is a photo of Ecuadorian cacao forest in, in Esmeraldas. And you, you see it looks like a, a secondary forest. So that's, um, yeah, that's amazing. And we want to push that because what we see on the, on the global scale and especially here in Ecuador is that things are moving in the opposite. So that's a image of a big um, farm here in Ecuador. You see them all around 100, 500 in Peru. Now there's one with more than 1000 hectares, monoculture. Um, after a few years doing that, you have a totally degraded soil, you have no biodiversity uh, on this spot, and it's, yeah, for, for nature, totally lost agricultural field. Yeah, and perhaps, um, yeah, you yeah. Want to, yeah, go. Yeah, it's Peru. It's your your terrain. It's it's Peru, yeah. But we have that for most of our origins already, and we'll have it for every origin. So we do very detailed greenhouse gas balance assessments. And what you can see here is from a study in Peru where they compared organic. I want to say here organic monoculture with organic agroforest. And what you can see in the light green is the cacao yield in tons dry beans per hectare, which in monoculture is a little bit more. In agroforestry, it's 20% less. But then the, in the climate balance, you can see that the tons of CO2 per hectare per year that these uh, cacao fields can absorb and can store uh, is 950% more. So uh, I think that's amazing. And then obviously people would always say, yeah, but then in agroforestry, people lose income. Can be, but if you do it right, can also not be true because it's 20% less cacao, but it can be um, more fruits, banana that you can sell, mangoes that you can sell. Yeah, and of course, and of course imagine, we would, imagine we would finally uh, you know, have, a, have a, a price for CO2, then the carbon yields here would of course you know, yield much more um, than than the cacao. So this is where we where we need to go. You know, in a in a in a climate restricted world, we would need to price this and uh, compensate farmers for what they're doing. Uh, you know, to to uh, stabilize our climate. So, which brings us to climate. Wow, I thought we were in climate already, but then here we go. Um, because of course, from the outset, we've had one for one trees as a program uh, that really from the outset of Origin Beans. When we designed it, we thought, hey, what is a benefit we can really bring to growers uh, for the premium we pay and translate to our customers in a way that is meaningful. And it turned out that trees back then were meaningful and they are still meaningful if you do it the right way. So we report 1.9 million trees grown in Origins. And perhaps, Jan, you want to say something to the um, to the mortality rate of these seedlings, because that's one that is often overlooked when when uh, companies report these numbers of trees, and then nobody asks, okay, what, what happens to the tree three years from now? Um, yeah, <clears throat> and, and it's interesting because to be very honest, it's not that we thought about the mortality pro, um, rate when we designed our, our reforestation programs, but uh, we are a chocolate company, so we uh, can only add a very small premium to our chocolate. So we didn't have a lot of money for these programs and we involved municipalities, we involved the farmers in a very first stage so that they really understand the 
uh, benefits and the importance of trees that they plant on their ground and then they have a real incentive of taking care of them um, and therefore the mortality rates that have been measured in um, Tanzania and in Peru as pilot projects are super low so it's um, in the one case it's five percent in the other case it's eight whereas if you look to big NGOs that pay you know like sometimes 30 euros for, for one tree, then uh, the farmers or the people who grow these trees get paid for everything. But if they don't understand the sense of the tree, the importance of the tree, then yeah, they, they, in the moment you stop paying, they stop caring. That's that's the biggest problem. So this the last year, this way we planted or our partners planted 617,000 trees, which is really a lot for such a small company as we are. Here you can see a um, nursery from Peru. It's funny, Philip, I always recognize because um, you asked me in the other call what what the country yeah, yeah. is. It, it's, you can recognize the country on the color of, exactly, the, of, these, of the plastics. Map. Exactly. I yeah, yeah, because um, is, blue is Peru and black yeah. is Ecuador. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so. And that's up. So we're doing this since uh, the beginning of the company, but here we just wanted to show the effect of the last five years. So in the last five years, we have been planting 2.69 millions of trees. And you can see here in the timeline that it's not the uh, same amount each year. It has been uh, increasing. Um, over, over the years. Last year it has been a little bit less. The record year was 2022. And yes, so even if maybe 400,000 per year it does not sound so much, if you do it for such a long time as we do, it, it adds up. And then it adds also up in terms of the um, tonnage of CO2 that gets drawn down. So essentially, I mean, uh, carbon is is uh, is you know one of the biggest most important molecules of life. You you probably all consist of about 20 percent, 20 percent carbon, and a tree about 50 percent. So you know, drawing down is perhaps the right description. We just destroy uh, life and forests and uh, ecosystems, and then we see you know, gets CO2 or C in this case, carbon gets up in the in the atmosphere and we have to bring it down back into the biosphere again. And forests are just a great way to do that. And so the agroforests and forest system that we are uh, co-managing with our growers have drawn down 15,221 tons of CO2 in 2023. And part of that is um, within the supply chain and each product and what we've, done here is to show you what we call the carbon balance or climate balance of a product and essentially it calculates all the emissions that are going into the production the transport the packaging the cooling that you know of um, a chocolate from the tree to the shelf and then um, you know the capacity of the forest the cacao forest to draw down that sea that gets emitted back into the biosphere and then you have in dark blue a net minus because what we want is the minus we want to get it out of the atmosphere so it's a minus that is beneficial climate beneficial and you can see here three chocolates one is the esmeraldas milk 42 one is the simply dark 62 from esmeraldas and then the vegan 50 from esmeraldas as well so the recipes are different the cacao content is different but all of them have a net negative or climate positive or net co2 negative um footprint which essentially means you eat more of this chocolate and mm. you have a very practical climate solution in hand. And now imagine what that would mean for the industry as a whole. Uh, again, it's the red and the green dot, you know, the, it, much of the industry is in deforestation and red. But if it could shift, chocolate should and could lead on climate, really. Um, and, and what you can see here is basically the summary of the points that we already have been presenting. So why is there such a huge drawdown in 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 of CO2 in the cacao forests? Because it's agroforestry, we have been talking about that. Because it's organically managed, we have been talking about that. And also because we, we use these old cacao varieties, because native cacao trees can 
uh, have quite good yields for 100, 150 years, whereas modern, so they are then also a tree in the system that, um, that, add that acts as a product. sink. Yeah, it's a long-term Not term like sink. a modern hybrid that after 10, 15 yeah, years is already yeah. dropping yeah. so much in production that you, um, yeah, that, that it's not relevant in the statistics. Great. Okay. We're coming to our last one. Still hold on and then we go into questions. So we might be a bit over time. Um, of course, I would have, if we had time, I would have uh, asked you to stand up and shake your legs and your, your arms and your head just to re relax for a moment. But we have that hour and it's also practical in that sense. So it's quite intense. I recognize we are totally able to give you the data uh, afterwards and, and um, hopefully in the session also answer a few questions that may have come up. So health is the last one that we want to report on. And essentially, I mean, in chocolate, um, independently of what you describe as the magic of cacao, um, the first one to address is sugar. And we've done a comparison with uh, other chocolate ranges. It's not a big scientific study, but it's very robust in the sense that we've taken a very conservative uh, um, percentage in comparison to our competitors, which is 8% less sugar than uh, competitors like Valrona and uh, Lindt, uh, you know, the, the premium Lindt line and and then um, Vivani excellence line, um, you know, in the organic market. So it's quite representative competitors. And and so we are able to reduce, um, sorry, we are able to reduce uh, sugar essentially because we use better cacao. And of course, many of you are familiar with that argument and that practice. And it's just true and we cannot, uh, you know, we should not stop to repeat it because health is an important one and the sugar um, policing is going to come uh, our way. We've seen sugar taxes, you know, start here and there. And since um, weight and malnutrition and obesity are such big issues in our pandemic issues in our society, sugar will be addressed. And so chocolate on the way out of sugar is really a good one. And you can see here, we just drew this up white milk and then the dark chocolates and essentially if you consume white or milk chocolate also a great original beans to milk chocolate most of what you take in is sugar uh, it could be white sugar or it could be brown sugar but it's sugar nevertheless and then once you get into the dark you get a very different kind of product that has less sugar and more of another drug which is cacao and there are great benefits which you can read about or you know, and I'm not going to go into those details, but um, to another, sorry, to another point. Oh, I don't have that other point here, um, which was essentially our last um, KPI, which we some lost on the back, <laughs> which is, a, which is, which we still calculate under, uh, under health, which is uh, waste. And um, it essentially talks about the biocompostability of all our packaging and approximately two tons per year we can save in uh, packaging, which is quite a lot. You know, two tons is a, is a, is a, is a hefty m small mountain of uh, stuff that um, we take out of uh, the, you know, whatever kind of recycling or rubbish cycle. Um, yeah, so that's essentially it. And I hope in general, this is a story that makes you believe or inspired to uh, consider the, you know, the recovery story, the re regeneration story, the story that it's absolutely possible to consume and to grow a business. And um, it's not easy, but to, you know, that it's possible to do that um, with the full regeneration of our world, our society's tradition and our health in mind. So with that, I want to thank you for your attention and pulling this through to an hour and I uh, want to open for question into the chat. I'm only getting AIs uh, uh, <laughs> so far. So, so it's it's probably the AIs who should raise the questions. Um, but if you feel encouraged to do that on your own rather than your AI, then please go ahead. Any questions? You want to ask your AI for a question? So, Lily, thanks for the question around the plastic. Yeah, 
Sorry, there were two slides. No, it's not uh, plastic. It's uh, um, wood cellulose, um, which we use. It's um, a product that was initially developed by a uh, British company called Inovia, um, which uses uh, wood cellulose, FSC certified wood cellulose. And um, it may be considered as plastic um, by the um, sort of pretty primitive uh, recycling systems we still have in our societies, but it is uh, fully compostable, garden co certified garden compostable when, within a couple of weeks, um, depending on the on the thickness of, of the strata, but um, it's a fantastic packaging material for chocolate. Is your business model suitable for big industry, asks Dan. Um, yes, I, I think so, of course. I mean, I think that I think that's not it's not the business model really. It's the um, it's the it's the product, you know. So it, it's just the way in which um, you know big candy has committed itself to big candy products. Nutella is the main uh, revenue maker for Ferrero, and it's going to be very hard for them to imagine to pull, you know. Nutella out of the market or change its recipe even by even tiny and slightly so they can of course go back and repair with their profits they can repair stuff um, but that doesn't make a really regenerative business model uh, unfortunately and so that's I think the biggest dilemma um, of the of the current uh, industry paradigm from most industries or many industries and there's only a few companies who dare to kill their darlings or to you know change uh, key revenue uh, makers <clears throat> and and build rebuild supply chains and rebuild markets but that's i think what it would take but in terms of in terms of scalability i i you know the investments necessary are not that huge it, it's really it's you know if you if you have to change the car industry you are in a totally different set of you know uh, uh, capex investments and, and and all sorts of you know much more complicated supply chains. So cacao is relatively chocolate is relatively simple. So it's it's more I think around the will to change the products themselves, and that goes back to of course the uh, pricing and the customer and the shelves and the you know usage of the product itself. So Philip, there's another question <clears throat> about. I'm not sure that this crazy increase in prices will be positive for little farmers in mid or long time. Are you agree? So yes, that's some very personal opinion now. I I agree on that. It has a lot of risks, um, not so much socially, but uh, more on the environmental side because you already can see that people are getting crazy and we're like, oh my God, cacao is so great. Let's. Um, uh, cut down more forests to grow more cacao so if this will be not controlled by by governmental authorities then that's a big problem and uh, on the social side i think it can be quite positive but it has to be in a controlled and educated way so if these farmers about are part of projects of big cooperatives and they say hey now you have more money let's um i don't know rebuild the school or invested in better food or so then this can have an amazing positive impact but what we have seen in colombia when uh, coffee prices raised a few years ago is basically that you have more uh, bars and more beer and more prostitution and more problems in remote villages so it can be both it depends a lot on who is who is the leading um yeah these these farmers and what they prefer on their own thanks jan i i would uh, suggest we take a few more minutes and then we close the session there are two or three more questions one is from lily about uh, the challenges of the company and open positions perhaps lily you just want to send an email to philip at originbeans.com around the positions and then we can give you an answer if that's you know one of the options um and then how is the chocolate climate balance managing the transportation carbon footprint um it's in there so um you know, in, in, in essence, uh, you can say that um, transportation on boat is pretty climate efficient and uh, transportation on the road is not. Um, so that leaves, 
you know, quite a spike in the um, in the emissions. Uh, actually, in fact, the largest emissions are on farm, and in and you know, it's it's by you know um, composing biomaterial. Uh, methane emissions are the are the are the biggest uh, emitter in our supply chain, but they are part of the natural cycle. So that's one you have to calculate into the carbon balance, but it's not something you want to take out of an organic, uh, you know, system. But transportation is just something we cannot avoid, and so we have to calculate it in. And then the uh, um, the forest system or the, the sequestration system, nature has to be strong enough to absorb this. Of course, there are ways to improve on transportation um, as i said boat is one we don't want to fly uh, around or we don't want to you know ship uh, uh, on 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 transporters for for too long um but and of course you know that there is a couple of companies who do sailing i think that's a great idea i, I wonder how scalable that is and i'm certainly for the innovation in using sails for transportation um, but I'm not sure that that really but, um, isn't. <clears throat> Sorry? But yeah. Philip, maybe maybe um, to this point because it or it's often used like sail shipping is the thing. And if you look to our um, greenhouse gas balance assessment, Correct. we have all our it's emissions. Not the, it's not the boat. Even on the emission side, transport the the boat transport is such a small piece. And then, yeah. if you compare it of impacts of just organic to non-organic agriculture, that's Correct. such a massive impact. Or agroforestry yeah. of no agroforestry. So before we talk about sail ship or no sail ship, we really need to change the practice yes. of how right. cacao is being growing. Yes. Super. Marta, thanks for the inspiration to put the uh, tempering <laughs> information on the packaging. Actually, it's on there. The new batches are all produced with great tempering information and everything else on the packaging. Finally, we got to it. <laughs> so there is a there's a decent amount of information on the bags and on the boxes and everything. So I hope that helps. But if it doesn't, then of course, we are always uh, available for hands on support. We have a great team in house of of uh, pastry uh, chefs and uh, and chocolate experts who can who can practically help on any issue and then there was one more question from unknown do each of your origin products have their own climate data ton kilo data yes they do so it's it's that's the that's the idea of a climate balance is essentially that you do it per um value chain and um, of course certain parts of that uh, supply chain overlap because you know the last uh, steps in the supply chain production to warehouse and so forth are the same for all chocolates, but the beginning agriculture and the initial transport and some of the other steps are different from Congo to uh, Bolivia to Peru. All right, so I think we are through the questions and we are aware that we've really pushed a lot of information your way and I hope it's been interesting um, and insofar as it was interesting also inspiring. And uh, we really thank you for making the time, for being our customers, our friends, our stakeholders. And um, if there are questions and if there's things we can do together, then, uh, you know, get back, you know, engage with us, uh, send us emails, give us calls, and we look much forward to working with you on Together 100% Regenerative. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks a lot also from my end for the interest of your and our work and the work of our farmers. Thanks a lot. Take care. Ciao. <clears throat>